Uh, as James said, my name's Adrian, if we haven't met before, I'm one of the team here at the church. Uh, it's my huge privilege to uh, kick off a brand new uh, teaching series for us this morning uh, on the book of Acts. And I'm particularly excited about this for two reasons. Firstly, I'm excited whenever we kick off you know, a new series, particularly when it's through a book of the Bible. I love reading through the Bible and letting the Word speak for itself, so I'm excited for that reason. But I'm particularly excited about this book that we're about to study, the book of Acts. Um, it's hard for me to put into words uh, how much of an impact this book has had on my life, uh, particularly when I first read it for myself I think about 10 years ago, it totally revolutionized my whole understanding of what it meant to be a Christian and what it meant to be the church. Um, these days, it's actually hard for me to share my story without talking about this book specifically and how much it's actually shifted my thinking, how much it's actually uh, put in me a holy discontent that I still can't shake off to this very day. So this book means a lot to me. Uh, and it's actually this book that led uh, Jess and I to uh, the New Frontiers family of churches generally and then to this church specifically. Uh, and so I can't really uh, overstate how much this book has really shaped my worldview. And so I just want to read through the text this morning. Uh, we're going to be uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. Uh, the passage is going to be up on the screen, but if you've got your Bible in front of you as well, that would be great. Uh, we're just going to read through it uh, a verse at a time uh, and let the word speak for itself. So I'm going to begin uh, in verse 1. Uh, verse 1 and 2, we'll start with that. It says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. A couple of things in those two verses. The first thing we need to know about the book of Acts is that it was written by Luke. It was written by Luke. Who was Luke? Well, Luke was not one of the apostles. He was not one of the 12 that Jesus had first handpicked. He was a doctor, though, and he was a, a close associate of the Apostle Paul, who, as you may know, wrote the majority of the New Testament. In fact, we know that uh, so close was he to the Apostle Paul that he accompanied him uh, on many of his later missionary journeys. And in fact, some people believe that Luke may have actually been uh, Paul's personal doctor. And if you know anything about Paul's story, he needed a doctor often. He went through a lot of stuff. <laughs> right? And so when we read about you know, in, in verse 1, it says Luke's talking about his former book. He's referencing his first book, right? We know that he's talking about the Gospel of Luke, right? Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. That's part one of the story, which makes Acts part two of the story, right? Luke says that in his former book, in his first book, the Gospel of Luke, he focused on all that Jesus began to do and teach, right? The Gospel of Luke is all about how Jesus got started, Right? But it was only about how Jesus got started. In other words, part two is not about what Jesus did to begin with. It's about what happened next. What did Jesus do in continuation of what he began? Right? The Gospel of Luke is the prequel, and the book of Luke is the sequel. Luke and Acts, two volumes of the same book by the same author. But here's a question. Right? How would Jesus continue the work that he began when we read in verse 2 that he was taken up to heaven. How does that make sense? How does Jesus continue the work that he had begun when he isn't even there, when he disappears, when he goes up to heaven? We'll read more about that later. But what we know is that the way that Jesus continued the work that he began is through the apostles. He handpicked these leaders who he not only chose, but also instructed and trained in order to make sure that his legacy and his work would continue even when he was no longer there physically. In a moment, we're going to find out why being picked by Jesus and being trained by Jesus was not even quite enough. We'll find out more about that later. right? But suffice to say, that's how this part two continues. It's through the apostles that Jesus continues the work he began. So the other person that we meet in these first two verses is a guy called Theophilus. 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 Now, who was Theophilus? It's a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, Theophilus was a distinguished, wealthy Gentile. Uh, he was a Christian, and he uh, had commissioned Luke to put together an orderly account of Jesus' life and also what happened after he went back to heaven. 
Right? A wealthy guy gave a whole bunch of money to Luke and said, Luke, I know you're a systems guy. I know you're a detailed person. Can you put together an account for me of everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus taught, as well as part two of the story, what happened next? That's who Theophilus was. But there's a problem, okay? And I want to kind of uh, give a bit of a sidebar before we continue on to verse 3. The, the fact that the book of Acts was written for Theophilus does not therefore mean that the book of Acts was written to Theophilus. Okay, what I mean by this is that Acts is not a letter. It's not a letter, right? Theophilus may have commissioned the book. He may have asked Luke to write this book for him, but it does not mean that the book was written to him, right? What I'm saying is this, is that the book of Acts that we're about to read is a narrative. That's the text type. It's not a letter. It's a narrative. It's a story. And it's on this particular issue that there's a lot of debate that goes on as to how we are to interpret this book. All right, let me explain what I mean. There's an argument as to how we are to approach the book of Acts and how we are to handle it correctly. See, on the one hand, there are some people who say that Acts is primarily a descriptive text, right? a, a descriptive text. It's narrative. It's a story. And therefore, it's by definition an account of what happened but that's all that it is. It's just a story. You read the facts and you go, yep, 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 that happened. It's history. It's a story. But in no way are we meant to copy this story. It's just a story. Right? There are some people who say that the book of Acts is to be treated as a descriptive text. But on the other hand, there are some people who say that, no, 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 it's not just a descriptive text. It's actually a prescriptive text that we are to treat the book of Acts as an instruction manual, as a how-to guide of how we are to do church today. They believe that the church has lost something, you know, that we need to go back to our roots, that if all we do is just follow this book verbatim, then all of the problems of the church will be resolved. So which one is it? Two choices, now's the time for a plebiscite. All right, let's vote, okay? Is it a descriptive text or is it a prescriptive text? You see, the problem with this debate, and perhaps other debates like it, is that we're being forced to choose between two things that we shouldn't be have to, that we shouldn't be have to force that we shouldn't be forced to have to choose. <laughs> right? You get what I'm saying? This is a false dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy. What do I mean? A false dichotomy is something that we're forced to make an either-or decision about when it's actually both and. It's actually both and. You see, uh, let me explain what I mean. You see. Uh, th this argument, I think, is a moot argument for a number of reasons. First reason is this. You may know the verse 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, 3, it says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. See, Paul, he says that all Scripture is God-breathed, not just the, the, the didactic portions of Scripture, not just the letter portions of Scripture, not just the prophetic portions of Scripture. He says, no, all Scripture is God-breathed. And therefore, all Scripture is used for teaching, for correcting, and for training, right? including those narrative portions of Scripture. It's all useful for those purposes. Now, to be fair, there are some portions of Scripture that are more uh, clear and more direct in their instructions to us, but to take out a whole book of the Bible and go, this is just a story, we can't imitate anything in it, is to go against that all-important verse, 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, the second reason why I think it's a moot argument is because just because uh, a book is a narrative doesn't mean that uh, we can't extract principles from it. In fact, if you were to take that line of argument, you would essentially be invalidating a, a whole bunch of people that are alive in the world today. Right? You realize that in our Western culture, yes, we do learn primarily t through propositional teaching. Here are some principles, here are some truths, learn the truths. Uh, but in a lot of cultures, both in history as well as even to this day, a lot of cultures are based on storytelling. Maybe you come from a heritage that's like that, right? You learn stories from your parents and your grandparents growing up, and as you learn those stories, you extract principles from those stories. And so to say, just because this is a story, we can't extract principles from it, you're saying that most of the world today have somehow flawed, have a flawed understanding of how to learn, right? Which is a big, which is a big call. See, third reason, here's another reason why uh, a, a strictly descriptive reading of this, uh, of this book is actually, I think, a very convenient way of keeping at arm's length things that you don't understand. It's a very convenient way of keeping at arm's length things that don't fit into your worldview. Right? We read stuff in this book. You're going to read things in this book that you go, seriously? Like, that can happen? 
And the way that we can explain that away is to go, oh, no, no, it's not prescriptive, it's just a description. This is a thing over here, I'm over here. Right? We've got to be careful of keeping Scripture at arm's length for that reason. But by the same token, you see, Acts is not purely prescriptive either. It's not. It's not a, here's a how-to manual, just follow it word by word and you'll get it right. As an example, if you read later on in chapter 1, we're not going to get to this today, but later on in chapter 1, there's a story of how they pick the new disciple to replace Judas. Right? Judas committed suicide, they needed a guy to fill his place. And their chosen method of picking that replacement was by casting lots, in other words, a form of gambling. Right? If, if we had to follow this prescriptively, we need to, talk to, we, we need to figure out how we recruit connect group leaders differently, because we're not doing, we're, maybe we should cast lots, maybe that's how we should do it. Right? The book of Acts is not purely prescriptive either, it's not, it's not a, every little detail, we are just to take it as is. It doesn't work quite like that. And then finally, if you read it carefully, right, most of the New Testament is actually not prescriptive. There's very little statements in the New Testament that go, this is exactly how I want you to do this thing. Even the two clearest examples of where Jesus said, this is how I want you to pray, and this is how I want you to take the Lord's Supper, he wasn't even saying those things in terms of, I only want you to use these words as you pray. He was trying to encapsulate for us what's the heart, what's the essence of prayer, and to model our prayers around that. And so, no, it's not purely prescriptive either. Right? It's both. It's, it is a description. It's a great story, and be entertained by the story. But there's so many things in it, so many big themes that are repeated over and over again, that if we are not to imitate those things into our time, into our place, then we're really not letting Scripture transform our life. And so that's really important to keep in mind as we read through this book. It's both descriptive and prescriptive. But let's continue reading from verse 3. Verse 3 says this, After his suffering, after Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. And we're going to get to verse 5 in a second. So let me first talk about verse 3 and 4. Right? Verse 3 and 4, what Luke's doing is he's giving a bit of a, uh, a recap of part one of his story. I don't know if you guys watch TV series, maybe on Netflix, and it's like a 20-episode you know, season. You kind of forget what happens in the, previous season, uh, in the previous episode when you watch the new episode. And so there's always like a 20-second, 30-second flyover of what happened in the previous episode, or maybe even in the whole season leading up to your episode. That's kind of what Luke's doing there. He's saying, this is kind of what happened in part one, right? Jesus suffered. He, was, uh, you know, he gave proofs that he was alive and so on. He's giving us a very general overview, using very general language. Right? He, he uses very non-specific language. He says he gave many convincing proofs, but he doesn't talk about what those proofs are. He says that Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, but then he doesn't expound on what those things were. But then if you notice, the shift from verse 3 to verse 4 is really interesting. Right? He goes from really general overview, trailer in verse 3, and then verse 4 he zooms in. It's kind of like he goes from a wide landscape shot to a close-up shot of a very particular detail. See, verse 4, it says, on one occasion, right, it talks about this specific instance. He says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. And then he quotes exactly what Jesus said. In other words, we've got to pay attention to what we're about to read. Because Luke's going from general, he's a broad sweeping overview to, let me show you this tiny little detail. And what we're about to read is actually crucial in understanding the rest of the book. So let's look at the, verse, uh, the next verse, verse 5. Or verse 4 and verse 5. This is what Luke wants us to see. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he begins by saying this. He says, Do not leave Jerusalem, Jesus says. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait but wait. See, the operative word there is wait. You see, I've read this verse countless times, right? And every time I've, re I've read this verse, I've always thought that it meant this. I thought that Jesus was saying uh, to his disciples, guys, just hold on. Don't move forward yet. Just, just wait. You know, keep in your, in your holding bay. I don't want you to move forward. Don't advance yet because you're not ready, right? And to be fair, I think that that is actually a correct interpretation of this verse. Jesus is saying, no, no, you're not ready yet. You'll see later on just how not ready they were. But he's like, no, no, don't go forward yet. Don't progress uh, forward in your mission. 
But it dawned on me this week that I was reading this verse that there's actually another way of understanding what Jesus was saying in this verse. See, as I've read this verse again, I think maybe Jesus wasn't telling the apostles not. Maybe he was saying, maybe he was not saying don't go forward. Maybe Jesus was saying don't go backwards. Maybe he was saying don't go forwards. Maybe he was saying don't go backwards. Let me explain what I mean. See, if you fast forward a little bit to verse 11, it says men of Galilee. Right? These men, these apostles, were from a town called Galilee, but where are they now? They're in, they're in Jerusalem, right? They came from Galilee, but now they're in Jerusalem. Here's my point. I think that the apostles would have been tempted after Jesus left to return to their old ways. See, they did that not that long ago. Remember when Jesus died, he was in the tomb for three days? What did the disciples do? Some of them went back to their old business. They went back fishing. They were like, oh, great, that was nice while it lasted, but I guess we should move on with our lives now. Let's go back to what we were doing before. They retreated. They went back to their old ways. And I think in the same way, Jesus knew that the moment he leaves them again, they would have thought, you know what, this time I'm really done. I'm going to go back to being a fisherman. You see, maybe Jesus was not holding them back from going forwards. Maybe Jesus was holding them from going backwards, back to their old lives in Galilee. You see, part of the reason why I also think this is true it's for a number of other things that we know about the, the apostles at this point. You see, Jesus would have needed to hold these guys back if the apostles were like super eager, super zealous, chomping at the bit, ready to evangelize the world. But the reality is that the apostles weren't like that at all. Even the guys that were like that, even Peter, he was the super eager guy, chop up a guy's ear, Jesus, just get out. Like, even the guys who were really pushing forward, what happened to Peter? Right, Peter denied Jesus three times, felt so guilty and so ashamed that Jesus had to really minister to him and bring healing into his situation before he could be restored to his place of leadership. Right, Peter, the, the most fiery guy amongst them, was kind of crestfallen. And other reasons, right? You know, we saw that when Jesus died, the, the apostles weren't like, okay, let's strategize, let's plan. No, they hid in a room, closed the door because they were scared of what might happen to them. See, these guys, I think, weren't really needing to be held back. They were actually needing to be pushed forward. And Jesus was saying, no, no, stay where you are. Wait, don't give up yet because in a couple of days, you're going to get something. You're going to experience something that's going to so revolutionize your world that you're going to be pushed forward to do all that I've called you to do. I right? saying, no, no, don't, yes, yeah, don't go forward yet, but also don't go backwards. Don't retreat to your former life. But look at the next thing Jesus says. He says, uh, uh, to, to wait, and he says, I want you to wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me about, you've, which you have heard me speak about. So Jesus is saying, guys, you know I've been trying to uh, drop clues, drop hints as to this gift that I'm about to give you. I've talked about it for so long. Guess what? You're about to get it. You're about to get this thing that I've promised to you, and it's going to be so good that it's going to be even better than having me in the flesh. This thing you're about to receive, this gift, is going to be so good, so precious, so powerful, that it's going to be better that I leave so that you can get it. And in the next breath, he tells them what this gift is. He explains it. He says, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, in the same way that John, John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, in the same way that he prepared the world for the arrival of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself was also doing a work of preparation. He was preparing the apostles, he was preparing the world for the arrival of the Holy Spirit in a new, fuller, more manifest way on planet Earth. You see, the Holy Spirit has and always been it's, he's always been active, he's always been present, he was there when the world was formed. But now Jesus is saying there's going to be a new era of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be here in a greater sense of permanency in your lives and in your midst. You see, looking at this quote, verse 5, it's safe to say that the Holy Spirit is going to feature quite heavily in the book of Acts. And you'll find that, I hope you find that, every single week, that it's going to be hard for us not to talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of people refer to the book of Acts as the Acts of the Apostles, right, following the journey of these guys as they ventured on their missionary journeys. But a more accurate way of describing this book is not the Acts of the Apostles, but the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We see what he does. We see how the Holy Spirit leads and moves and guides and shapes and transforms and heals. And in fact, the Holy Spirit is mentioned nearly 60 times in the book of Acts. 
But we could kind of clarify that statement a little bit, though. Because even though the book of Acts is about the Holy Spirit, yes, it is, and he is a starring character, it's also a book very much about Jesus. Right? Remember how we said the book of Acts is about the ongoing work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, outworked by the apostles? It's all of those things together. It's not, is it about the apostles or is it about Jesus or is it about the Holy Spirit? Again, false dichotomy. It's all of those things together. It's about the apostles. It's about the Holy Spirit. And it's also about Jesus. Right? In fact, if you read what we've just read carefully, if you read this whole passage, verse 1 to 11, every single verse in this introductory passage of the book of Acts either mentions Jesus explicitly or references him indirectly. Jesus is not to be missed here. He is starring, he is front and center, not just in this passage, but in the entire book of Acts. We need to know that, that we are Holy Spirit people. Yes, we are, but the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus and we love the Holy Spirit because he loves Jesus and Jesus loves the Holy Spirit. See, I'm not just... Right, you get the point. Let's, let's kind of bring all of these threads together as we approach this book. But let's keep reading. Verse 6 to 7. Verse 6 to 7. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Uh, and then I'll pause again before we get to verse 8. Okay, so here's what's happening in verse 6 to 7. I think Luke has. Uh, very humorously included this quote for us to show us just how unprepared the disciples still were at this point. Right? Think about what's going on. Jesus has invested. He, he knew that he didn't have much time on earth. So he's like, I'm going to pick 12 guys, pour my life into them, give them my best, show them stuff, bring them up on a mountain. Oh, transfiguration. This is incredible. Change your life, right? These guys should be ready. They've been discipled by the best of the best. Right? Like, there's nothing more that they can get and yet, here's what's going on. The moment before Jesus is literally about to float into the sky and say, my work here is done, they're coming out with this kind of junk. But look, think, think about the question that they're asking Jesus. Verse 6, what they're saying is this. They still think, after all that Jesus has done, after all that Jesus has taught, they still think that Jesus is on about some political or military agenda. He's like, oh, great, now that you're back alive, are you going to take over the Romans now? Is that what you're going to do? Don't you feel bad for Jesus? Leadership's tough, but leadership when you're perfect is a lot harder, right? Imagine, imagine, uh, like, but he was slow to anger, right? He didn't react, he could punch, like, he's probably, maybe in a human sense, freaking out. I don't know what's going on in Jesus' mind. But then he reads verse 8. Right? Because this, this is what he's saying. In response uh, to this kind of foolish question, Jesus says, it's not for you to know that. In other words, stop preoccupying yourself with things that you will never need to know and things that don't matter. You kind of got the wrong focus, guys. Just put that to one side. Don't worry about that stuff, but here's what you do need to know. Right? That's the shift in verse 7 to 8. You're asking these questions that are kind of irrelevant at this point, but let me direct your attention to something that you will need to know and you can know with absolute certainty. And then he says what he says in verse 8. Now, before I read verse 8, let me tell you why verse 8 is probably the most important verse in the entire book of Acts. Right? It's the most important book in the entire book of Acts, I think, for two reasons. Firstly, a lot of people say that this book, kind of, oh, sorry, this verse, verse 8, acts as kind of like a contents page. It, it summarizes for us the structure of what we're about to read in the entire book of Acts. Right? Here's, here's what happened. So in... You know, in ver it, Jesus in verse 8, like, actually, let me just read it, and then we'll talk about it. So he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right? It serves as a contents page, because he first talks about being witnesses in Jerusalem, and that kind of covers chapters 1 to 7, that focuses on Jerusalem. And then chapters 8 to 12, the church focuses on Judea and Samaria. They kind of move from Jerusalem and start working in the wider regions. And then the remaining chapters, chapters 13 to 28, uh, the church kind of explodes and witnesses to the ends of the earth, and they kind of scatter to all different places. So that verse, uh, even for that reason alone, is pretty important. It kind of breaks down the structure of the book for us. But the verse is also extremely important because I think it 
it, it's so comprehensive, right? It answers all these questions for us. And we just go to the next slide. It answers four big questions. It answers, firstly, the question of how. Right? We go, okay, Jesus called these guys to do this incredible, massive task. How are they going to do it? We get the answer through the Holy Spirit. With power, right? The Greek word for power being dynamis, right? That's where we get the word dynamite, that there's going to be power as we read this book, that as we see the Holy Spirit at work, stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to blow up in the spiritual. Things change, and you're going to see this play out over and over again. You're going to see the how, the power of the Holy Spirit playing out. And also answers the question of what, right? It tells us that this is what I've called you to do, guys. This is what I've asked you to do. I've asked you to be my witnesses. I've asked you to be my witnesses. That's the core business of what these disciples have been commissioned to do. So it answers the how, it answers the what, but also answers the where. Right? As we just said, it's Jerusalem, it's Judea and Samaria, and it's to the ends of the earth. In other words, what it means is this. It's start locally. Uh, move regionally, and then go national, and then expand global, right? This is the scope of the mission. Be my witnesses, not just here in this one place, but I want you to do kind of this concentric circle thing. Drop a rock in the pond and let the ripples go out to the ends of the earth. Right? It tells us the how, the what, the where, and also tells us the who, which we've already talked about, the Holy Spirit. He's the one that accomplishes, accomplishes it through these people. Let me uh, wrap up this for us, verse 9 to 11. This is uh, how it ends. Verse 9, it says, After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Uh, if you have kids or if you've got kind of kids in your family uh, and you've ever given them a helium balloon, right, you know what happens when they accidentally or maybe purposefully release that balloon. Right? They, I mean, they cry and they freak out and they scream for one, but what happens is when they release a helium balloon into the sky, everyone does this. And then you kind of just keep watching it until it disappears from sight. Like, if something is floating into the sky, you look, especially if it's a guy. Especially if that guy is not just any guy, but it's your friend. Like, it's your teacher, it's your rabbi, but not just that. This is the guy that you thought, yes, we've finally got him back. He's died, he's come back to life. We get to be with him forever now, and he's like, he's literally floating into the sky. You know why I think Jesus is funny? Because he's probably, I, maybe this is heretical, I don't know, but maybe he's just frustrated. He's like, if you're seriously still not going to get what I'm on about, I'm just going to leave right now. I'm not going to give you a heads up. I'm not going to say, guys, see you later. Let me explain what's about to happen. I'm just going to float away because he can do that because he's God. But seriously, he doesn't give a heads up. He doesn't explain what's going on. He's literally, he says one thing and then, oh, see ya, I'm going now. Like, can you imagine how awkward that would have been for the disciples? They're just like, what, 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 what's, like what's, what's going on here? Like, they're kind of dumbfounded, and I can understand why. They're awestruck, they're confused, and probably a little bit scared. And so in verse 11, uh, an angel shows up. They're like, guys, it's all right. It's going to be okay, right? Jesus is coming back in, in, in the exact same way that you saw him leave, so it's going to be okay. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why, why do you think the angel chose to comfort them by telling them that he was going to come back? Why is that comforting for them? Right? I, think, I think that truth, that reality could be comforting for them for one of two reasons. Maybe the angel was trying to say, guys, don't be sad because Jesus is going to come back and he can give you a hug again soon and he's just going for a drink and he'll be back and you can kind of hang out again. But the reason why, of course, we know that that's not right is because he doesn't come back in their lifetime. Like if, if, the, if the angel is just saying, guys, don't worry, he's, you're going to see him again soon in your lifetime, then the angels are kind of cruel because they're setting them up for something which never happens. Right? The fact that Jesus is going to come again is not comforting for that reason. See, I think the reason why the, angel, uh, the angels decided to tell the disciples that Jesus was coming back again soon was actually not to comfort them at all. It was actually to kick them into action. He's saying, guys, remember how Jesus said when he came for the first time, he, his mission uh, on his first visit to earth was to seek and save the lost. 
Right? That's what he came to do the first time. But remember, he's also said, when he comes back the second time, that's not going to be his mission anymore. He's done that. He's, he's come to seek and to save the laws. When he comes back again, he's coming to judge the living and the dead. He's coming to sort out those who belong to him from those who do not belong to him. So if he's coming back again and he's giving you this mission to reach the world, guys, you better get on with that mission. Right? You better get on with it because he's coming back again soon, sooner than you think. And so it's time to move. It's time to get going, but not until we see the Holy Spirit poured out. But you're going to have to wait next week to hear more about that. But here's, here's how I want to end, okay? I'm not that cruel. I'm not like Jesus just going to float off, okay? Here's, here's, how, here's what, did I just say Jesus was cruel? Can you edit that out of the podcast? That's, that's not true. Okay, here's how I want to end. I want to get real practical uh, and go back to verse 8, actually. So it's on the screen. Um, as I said, verse 8 kind of plays itself out like concentric circles, right? There's the local, there's the regional, national, then global. You know, the really cool thing about being a part of a family of churches, part of New Frontiers, is that we get to hear a lot about the global stuff. Um, maybe some of you were here last year when Dave, uh, this year, when Dave Devonish came early a couple of months ago, and he just had all these stories, right, stories of what is happening in places that you and I will probably never go, underground China, uh, in the Middle East, in these uh, Muslim areas, right, where the gospel is advancing. We kind of get to access um, the outer fringes. Actually, can you put up the next slide as well? This might help. Uh, we got to kind of access the number five stuff, you know, being a part of a family of churches, and that's really cool. It's a real privilege. Uh, and, you know, also more recently, as we've talked about this vision to plant sites all over Sydney, we're beginning to think more about the, you know, the four threes as well. You know, we're talking about reaching a city for Jesus. We're talking about planting sites, you know, all over the city. We're talking about going national, and that's really exciting, and it's great. You see, the unfortunate thing is that I think sometimes Christians, we can get really excited about mission as something that happens over there. Like, it's, it's exotic, it's foreign, let's go reach people that haven't heard about Jesus, and that's important, don't get me wrong, but it's sometimes easier for us to get on a plane to go to a different country than it is to get out of our door and walk and knock on our neighbor's door. Right? Sometimes the distance between us and the person in front of us is further than us and the person who lives in a village somewhere that we've never heard of. And so today... Uh, I'm excited to announce and to launch Love DY officially. This is our church's way of saying, hey, let's do Jerusalem right. Like, we want to do the ends of the earth, but let's get Jerusalem right. Let's make sure we are making an impact here. You guys have heard about Love DY for months and months. We've been talking about it, teasing you about it. But today is the day that Love DY gets launched. And I want to spend the next few moments telling you about 13 teams, 13 different things I'm going to be doing throughout this week in October. And then what you're going to do is you are going to sign up. I'm not saying that you might sign up, you will sign up. Maybe for one thing, maybe for two things, maybe for 13 things. Who knows? Surprise me. Surprise, surprise the elders. We're going to talk about Love DY. Okay? We're really excited about this uh, campaign. It's a campaign, if you haven't heard about it, that we're doing in the month of October. And it's our way of sharing the love of God uh, to as many people in DY as possible in as many different ways as possible. Can we just be real about this? Like Jesus called the apostles to reach the ends of the earth. And he's called us to reach the ends of the earth as well. But he wants us to start actually with DY, reach our neighbors. Uh, there's a lot of ways we could do that. We could do that all individually. But there's a power that comes together when it's like, okay, we're a collective, we're a family. Let's do this together. But what can we do if we have one big thing rather than all these little things? This is our avenue to do that. So let's get involved. All ages, it doesn't matter what you can do. You can do something. Uh, you can contribute to this week being a great success. So can you guys stand? I just want to pray for us and for this week. And then I'm going to release you to get onto your phones and sign up or to head to the back and sign up for as many teams as you feel crazy enough to sign up for. So uh, let me pray for us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you that it is a book of Acts, that there's things that happen, that you are acting, that you are acting not just back then when, we read, when these things happen, but you're acting here and now. And you're not just acting kind of in a weak uh, you know, lukewarm way, but you're acting with power, with dynamis, with Holy Spirit power that courses through our veins, that courses through us individually, but also courses through us as a church. And so we pray that uh, just as you've commissioned us to reach our Jerusalem, our Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth, that you too would call us as a church to reach the nations, the far off places that we don't know yet, that you call us to reach our nation, that will make a huge impact here in Australia. They will call us to reach our region, the northern beaches, Chatswood and beyond. But 
primarily and perhaps right now focuses on our DY, our Jerusalem, our neighbours right now. Lord, would you be uh, uh, convicting us, pushing us forward, making us excited, Lord, for this campaign that we're about to launch, Love DUI. Lord, that you'll give us new gifts, that you would fan into flame existing gifts so that we can give all that we have uh, to see your truth uh, proclaimed and so that we can be witnesses, just like you said, uh, to the ends of the earth. So we uh, commit this week to you. We ask that you will breathe on it and do a supernatural work uh, as you love DY uh, through us. And we pray this in your name. Amen.